My name is Mark Renwick. I'd like to welcome you to the June meeting of the First Coast Free Thought Society. We are an organization of free thinkers, atheists, agnostics, humanists, and others who promote science, reason, and compassion over dogma, faith, and belief in the supernatural. This is our second virtual lecture meeting. And while we hope to get back to in-person meetings as soon as possible, we'll continue to host virtual meetings like this one for the time being. You can learn about our other activities at our meetup page, which is meetup.com slash First Coast Free Thought Society. Uh, let's see, those of you using Zoom are invited to submit comments and questions in the chat window. You can find the chat on off switch at the bottom of your screen on your computer. You may need to move your mouse around a little bit in order for that to pop up. Or if you're on a mobile device, just tap the screen and chat should appear as an option. Or you may need to tap the more icon, that's what it's called, that looks like three dots. During the presentation, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website. This evening's speaker, David Jaffe, is a professor of sociology at the University of North Florida. He has a PhD in sociology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Okay. Go ahead, uh, has, That's where I went. <laughs> he has served as an administrator and faculty member at UNF since 2000. He teaches courses in the introduction to sociology, political sociology, social change and international development, and data analysis. He is currently serving as co-chair of the Jacksonville chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Let's welcome David Jaffe. Take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. And let me see if I can share my screen. So we will have some PowerPoint slides. And... Okay, so I want to go back to, all right, can everyone see those? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, let me first thank the First Coast uh, Free Thought Society for continuing to organize these events and inviting me to speak. This organization does represent one of the best venues in Northeast Florida, if I may say so, and I'm sure Mark will agree, for serious consideration of important topics and civil discourse on these various issues that are brought up by the various speakers you have. Uh, COVID-19 represents, in my view, the most monumental, deep-seated social, economic, and health crisis of our lifetime. When I think about how all this will end, I sometimes fall into a deep depression. On the other hand, all crises are opportunities, and from my academic perspective, I can tell you that uh, this is a sociological gold mine, and I shouldn't put it in positive terms, uh, but what I mean by that uh, is it offers a unique opportunity to study socioeconomic dynamics of a society that could only have been possible if we had conducted an experiment. Now we actually have a natural uh, experiment, and so we can be studying aspects of the way people adapt to these conditions that are utterly, utterly unique and unprecedented. I think most people are familiar with the term American exceptionalism. <clears throat> it uh, refers to the fact that presumably uh, the U United States is uniquely virtuous, uniquely competent, driven by only the noblest principles and a model for all other nations. Uh, I think Obama described the United States as the indispensable nation. That's a reflection of the, that's a reflection, did you hear that? Okay, that's a reflection of the American exceptional uh, perspective. Uh, to a large extent, this is a kind of ideology. It's a mythology uh, that has been prevalent for a long time. And obviously tonight, I'm gonna talk about the ways in which uh, we are not entirely exceptional. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19 and the coronavirus, on almost every measure, and that is number of cases, uh, hospitalizations, number of deaths, uh, the U.S. has been an exceptional failure. Uh, many other nations have managed the crisis much better than we have. Um, and while we might want to attribute this uh, to a particular person or a particular administration, 
And I think you know what I'm referring to. Uh, as a sociologist, I look for structural systemic explanations. And this can be found in the political economic system of the United States is what I'm gonna talk about uh, tonight. Uh, you might recall a comment that Anthony Fauci made uh, at the very early stages. This was in March. He was before congressional. It was a congressional hearing. <clears throat> and he said, the system is not really geared for what we need right now. And I think that was a, a prescient and accurate comment. He didn't say what system he was talking about. That's the system I will talk about tonight. But clearly he understood that the United States is not organized in a way that allows itself to manage this kind of a crisis. Um, you know, crises do reveal a lot about the shortcomings of any nation's economic, social, and political system. And this crisis has certainly done that. Uh, the question is, what will we learn from what has been revealed? Uh, the U.S. has been the victim of another crisis, uh, another virus, and that's what I want to talk about. <clears throat> and it's a virus that uh, has um, been present in the United States for about 40 years, and it's eaten away at both the social fabric of the society as well as the body politic. And that economic virus is known as neoliberalism. Uh, so I want to say something about this concept. There is often confusion about what it means, and there certainly is an enormous, enormous literature on neoliberalism. But since that is the foundation of my uh, talk tonight, uh, I want to be clear on what that means. So we can think of uh, pre-existing conditions uh, that a society has uh, that are in place that would make it more or less likely that one could manage a crisis of this magnitude. And the point I'm trying to make is that the pre-existing condition, and probably the single most important broad umbrella under which we can talk about other aspects of American society, the pre-existing condition is neoliberalism or neoliberal uh, capitalism. So neoliberal capitalism was essentially instituted as a result of the crisis in the 1970s. And it was really uh, put in place, I would say, most seriously in uh, 1980 uh, under the Reagan administration. We had an economic crisis in the 1970s. And it was a crisis where the capitalist class, and I'll be using that kind of language as a, a Marxist and as a socialist, uh, the capitalist class uh, was unhappy, <clears throat> and they began to disinvest. The economy slowed down. We went into a recession. And that was a major economic crisis. Some of you were around during that time. Uh, that was the late 70s. And the capitalist class really was disinvesting, and the economy went into crisis because they had four major complaints. One was they thought taxes were too high. Regulations were too stringent. The welfare state was too generous. And labor unions were too strong. Those were the four areas that they were critical of because they did not believe, given taxes, regulations, the welfare state, and the strength of labor, that they were able to capture as much profit as they believed they were entitled to. So a new political economic regime it's sometimes called a project, was instituted. Uh, it was building up for a long time, uh, but it was finally instituted fully uh, under Ronald Reagan. It is a bipartisan arrangement. That means that both Republicans and Democrats have operated as neoliberals. So I have a short definition here. Um, it's a political economic ideology, and it's also a set of policies and it is designed to reestablish the domination of corporate economic power. And by the way, it's been extremely successful, as many of you are probably aware. Now, it's called neoliberalism because the liberalism it's making reference to is classical philosophical liberalism. It's not the American style liberalism we associate with the Democratic Party. This is the liberalism of less government, of free markets, and the rhetoric of neoliberalism, which makes it so seductive, is freedom and liberty. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> freedom and liberty for who, right? So think about the ways in which that kind of ideology gets translated into a certain set of uh, policies. Now, in terms of the ideology, I have some quotes here 
and some of you may remember these. Uh, the first one, and this is, a, this is a quote from Ronald Reagan when he was running uh, for president uh, in, let's see, 1979. And he went around essentially talking about the fact that government could not solve any problems. And he said, the nine most terrifying words in English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. He went on to say, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. So there was an anti-governmental aspect to neoliberalism. There always has been. It doesn't mean that they reject the role of government entirely. Under neoliberalism, the government does play a significant role in enhancing conditions that maximize private profit. And the government also plays a role in insulating the market, the capitalist economy, from democratic uh, demands. Uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, also took office around the same time as Reagan, and she was considered another major figure in instituting neoliberalism in Britain. And she was famous for saying, quote, and you know, there is no such thing as society. No such thing as society. There are only individual men and women and families. So there's no such thing as society. Government is the problem. Uh, the most terrifying words are that the government is here to help you and assist you. And I did say this is a bipartisan project. Bill Clinton famously noted in one of his State of the Union addresses, the era of big government is over. <clears throat> and to a large extent, it was Bill Clinton that normalized and deepened uh, neoliberalism as a political economic philosophy and a set of political economic policies. So we've had this political economic regime in place since about 1980. It has impacted every aspect of our lives. Uh, many people assume that capitalism just evolves in some natural way. And so what exists in the United States today is just sort of the highest form of the evolution of capitalism. That would be a mistake to think that there's anything natural uh, about this. It was a project that was put in place and it is designed to represent certain class interests and it has had enormous implications for the ability of a society like the United States to actually respond to a crisis of this magnitude. <clears throat> so one of the things that comes out of the quotes of Reagan and others is essentially that uh, government is bad and markets uh, are good, uh, that markets are efficient, uh, the government is bureaucratic. Everyone has heard this, right? In, in a sense, this is sort of a kind of indoctrination. If you ask most Americans, you know, would you prefer a market solution or a government solution? Most people would say a, a market solution because to a large extent, they've been indoctrinated to think that markets work well, they're more efficient, government is bureaucratic, it's stodgy, it doesn't get things done well uh, at all. So this becomes a pretty deep-seated uh, ideology under neoliberalism. And the idea is that the market can solve all our problems, the magic uh, of the market. Uh, and so the net result is that, you know, there's no public ob obligation. Uh, there's no collective responsibility to care for each other. Uh, everyone is on their own. It's very individualistic. Uh, if you need something, you pay for it. Uh, if you want to be successful, you just work harder. But don't expect the government as an institution to protect you, to provide you with certain kinds of services. So it's a, uh, an ideology of, of hyper-individualism that to a large extent totally rejects the concept of solidarity. And this is obviously a damaging ideology when you need people to come together around a crisis of this magnitude. Now I'm touching here on a few aspects of uh, neoliberalism which have a direct impact on our ability to respond to the crisis. One is simply we have a private for-profit healthcare system. So if we're doing a comparative analysis and we're looking at countries that have been able to manage this crisis well versus those that haven't, those that manage it better have a universal healthcare system or what is called now Medicare for all in the debate that's been going on. Instead, we have a healthcare system which does not give people full access. Many people can't afford it. Many people don't see the doctor simply because the cost of seeking any kind of health care would be prohibitive. <clears throat> and so this contributes to the problem of trying to protect a population with a public health 
challenge, right? So in a, in a sense, what I'm saying is a public health crisis requires a public health infrastructure. And when Fauci said the system is not built to handle this, what he was talking about was the fact that we have a private healthcare system rather than a public healthcare system. And <clears throat> neoliberalism would support that private for-profit approach. And Obamacare really did not address that aspect of it. Obama, in my view, was also a neoliberal. His rhetoric was better than others, but ultimately the policies were not significantly different. The other aspect of neoliberalism is, as I said, one of the complaints was not taxes are too high, which means you need to cut taxes, which starves the government of revenue to actually provide services that people need. The other is that the welfare state is too generous. People are depending too much on it. What they need to do is get out into the job market, into the labor market, and find a job. That is the basis on which one survives economically. So there was a rolling back of the what we call the social safety net uh, of the social welfare state. The United States has the stingiest social welfare system of any major industrialized country. It's not even close. So when you hear people complain about welfare in the United States, you can tell them that we are actually the stingiest. And there's multiple, multiple measures that indicate how stingy we truly are. Now we're stingy because of the neoliberal ideology. Now it's not that these other countries haven't adopted some aspect of neoliberalism, they had, they have, it's just that the United States is the most advanced <laughs> neoliberal predatory capitalist society. And there are consequences for that status. Now, labor's too strong, so let's weaken labor market institutions. Many European countries, other advanced industrial societies, they have all kinds of labor market institutions that protect workers, that give workers rights, collective bargaining, uh, making it easy for them to organize and join unions. There was an attack on labor. Now think about all of these, as I'm going through all of these, think about the fact that the healthcare system, the social safety net system, the ability of workers to bargain and protect themselves in terms of compensation and working conditions, all of these things have been rolled back. And now we have this crisis. So what's the relationship between the neoliberal model, these consequences, and the ability uh, to manage uh, the crisis? There is a general level of economic insecurity. It's been pretty much the case over the last um, probably 15 to 20 years. And by uh, ec economic insecurity, we, we have a term in sociology, it's become an area of study. And we, we came up with this, the, the precariat, right? Like the proletariat, the precariat, the precariat, people whose jobs are precarious. And there's this massive literature on precarious work. People whose jobs are insecure, they don't have benefits, um, they, they have uh, <clears throat> low wages. And so increasing numbers of the American population are essentially economically insecure. And we know that because surveys have been done, 50%, 40 to 50% of the American population will tell these people who do these surveys that, you know, if you had a crisis, how much money would you be able to, you know, how much money do you have saved? 50% of the population says, I don't have more than, you know, if, if, it's, a cri if it's a crisis that involves a, you know, $400, $500, $600, I wouldn't be able to handle that crisis. I would have to borrow the money. So even though we have all this talk about how great the economy is, it didn't take long, like two weeks, for people to need immediate relief because they don't have sufficient amounts of savings because <clears throat> economic insecurity uh, is widespread. And again, the Neoliberal model has contributed to that. Now, most of you might know this, but uh, today uh, the level of income and wealth inequality in the United States is greater than it's ever been in history and since we've been able to collect good, solid data. So over this whole period, this 40-year period, the distribution of income and wealth has become increasingly unequal, and the level of inequality between white and black and white and Latino has also increased. And we know what the consequences of this are. Some people are much more likely to get sick. Some people are much more likely to be exposed on a job. Some people are much more likely to be hospitalized. And we know that for the black population in the United States, 
three to five times more likely to die from COVID-19. Okay, so that gives you some sense of the neoliberal model, the conditions it's created, and the way in which that has made this crisis so much worse. There's a couple other things I wanna mention that I think are important, and that is the corporate restructuring that took place. Uh, when neoliberalism was introduced, uh, there was also an effort by all corporations to figure out the best way to maximize profit. And one of the ways to maximize profit was to think about how different aspects of a production process could be sourced globally in locations where wages are low, regulations are minimal, labor unions are outlawed, what have you, right? So we had this period, uh, some people call it the Nikeification, and they use Nike as the prototype. Nike doesn't own any factories. Nike does not manufacture any sneakers. They design them and they market them and they brand them. But all production has been outsourced, right? So somebody else, they outsource it, they contract it out to a manufacturer and that manufacturer is offshore. So all of our supply chains, so to speak, have been globalized and you've got production taking place in all of these different locations. Now, when a crisis occurs and suddenly we actually need certain um, equipment, uh, certain kinds of medical uh, technologies, how can we get it quickly? It's very difficult to get things quickly, to move fast and to produce what we need if we have offshored and outsourced production all over the globe. This is a serious, serious problem. Um, and remember, all of these decisions are based on how can a corporation maximize profit and how can they enhance shareholder value? And shareholder value responds very positively to these things. When these large corporations decided to shed the manufacturing unit, outsource it and offshore it, stock price went up. Right? They were rewarded financially by Wall Street for this kind of behavior. So if you're you know, making decisions based entirely on the maximization of profit and shareholder value, you are going to organize production in ways that don't necessarily meet the needs of the American population, especially during time of crisis. And we can talk about deindustrialization because we know the entire, you know, Northeast, Midwest used to be the industrial heartland. Drive through there now, you see the factories that have been closed people have lost their jobs, all of that contributes to the inequality. But I'm pointing to this because we've had this problem having uh, access to enough testing kits, a personal protective equipment, respirators, ventilators. Why are we having this problem? It's because of the way production has been reorganized. Now, the other aspect of this is what's called just-in-time inventory. Corporations believe that it's important only to have what you can sell immediately. Most corporations are rewarded for not stockpiling large amounts of goods in a warehouse. In fact, they don't even want to use the term warehouse anymore. That's forbidden in the business school. It's called the distribution center because goods are always moving quickly. So if you have something produced, you want to realize the profit on that commodity as quickly as possible. So you don't stockpile goods. And you have this shift toward what's called just-in-time inventory. That is, you have the goods delivered when you have a demand and you can sell them immediately. So there was no incentive for hospitals or medical centers to stockpile respirators. It was not profitable or ventilators. Why are we gonna stockpile a bunch of stuff that we can't use immediately and sell immediately or you know, use for the purposes of somebody's uh, healthcare in the hospital that they would pay for? So we have a shortage of those things. So you have to understand the relationship between the shortage of what we need, the reorganization of production that occurred under this neoliberal model driven by, first and foremost, which is rational for corporations to maximize their profit and to enhance shareholder value. And many of the people who run the organizations also own large amounts of shares. <laughs> so they win from that. Okay. A couple other items that I want to mention that are relevant to the COVID-19. <clears throat> one is the deregulation of the food industry. Remember, one of the criticisms, the capitalist class back in the 70s, regulations were too stringent. We know there's been an ongoing effort to deregulate almost every industry. 
And this is taking place with a vengeance under uh, Trump, by the way. Uh, but no one's paying attention to that because he just makes idiotic statements all the time. And that distracts people. But behind the scenes, there's massive levels of continuing levels of deregula environmental deregulation, corporate deregulation, safety deregulations, et cetera. Well, the food industry has been deregulated. And this has produced monopolies in the production and sale of uh, meat. And we know what's happened in those massive, large scale uh, meat plants, factories, basically. Uh, they've had huge outbreaks. And uh, that threatens the supply chain of food, right? So you have this concentration of power as a result of the deregulation, which is consistent with the neoliberal model. There's also an emphasis on intellectual property rights that corporations should have total control of things that they develop and they can control that through patents. And once they have the patent, um, if somebody wanted to, for example, produce the same kind of masks that 3M produces, they'd say, well, that's a patent violation because we have intellectual property rights. So you can't reverse engineer these products and produce them yourself, that's a violation. So there's been an extension of these intellectual uh, property rights. And this affects both respirators, ventilators, but also, obviously, and importantly, uh, pharmaceuticals. When a vaccine, if there is ever a vaccine developed, uh, who's going to control that? Who's going to determine the price? Uh, who's going to have access to it? Um, remember, these corporations invest money to produce things because they want to make a profit. They're not producing it necessarily because they want to save life. And you can actually see that because pharmaceutical companies have tended to focus much of their investment and development of new drugs on the basis of what is not a cure, but a drug that is something that one will need throughout their entire life. So those decisions are made on the basis of the calculation of profit. The last item I'll mention is really sort of a global neoliberalism issue. And that is the way that food production and the production of raw materials, primary products, agricultural goods have been organized under global neoliberalism. You have a massive, what's called land grabbing, you have deforestation, you have monoculture, monocultural agriculture. And what's this done, what, has, what this has done is it has destroyed the natural habitat of many species. It forces them to move to other locations. It undermines biodiversity. And a zoonotic threat and a zoonotic virus is what the COVID-19 is called. And I'm not scientifically capable of analyzing all of the aspects of this, but the point is these are viruses that are transmitted from animals to humans. And I'm just pointing to one book because it was very prescient. And that is a book written by Mike Davis. Mike Davis is a, a social scientist. He writes on a lot of urban issues, but back about 10 years or so, uh, he wrote this book, The Monster at, I, at Our Door, and he was essentially arguing that given the way we are organized production across the globe, the way we're engaging in deforestation, the destruction of the environment, the climate change, uh, habitat threatened for different species, the elimination of biodiversity, he brings all this stuff together in this book to argue that it's inevitable that eventually there will be a global pandemic it's here now. Okay. So I would encourage you to check out his, his work. That book was written some time ago, but if you do a search on Mike Davis, coronavirus, he has all kinds of writings that have come out in various media uh, over the last three months because people have invited him based on that book to share his thoughts about what's happening currently. Uh, who's that? All right, you know who that is. Okay. So that's the cover of The New Yorker, and um, I would be. Uh, negligent uh, if I didn't say something uh, about the fact that one of the reasons that the United States is an utter a failure uh, is due to the uh, incompetent and irresponsible actions of the Trump administration. Now, I don't think that's the only problem, and that's the point I wanted to make at the very beginning. Even if Trump was not in office, we have an infrastructure, a social welfare, and a public and a and a healthcare infrastructure that is simply not designed to protect the population, and it's anti-government, et cetera, right? So, but as if that wasn't bad enough, then we have Trump's response. We know that he disinvested in pandemic preparation. 
Uh, I think he disbanded a pandemic uh, task force uh, for weeks, six or more weeks. Uh, he simply denied that it was a problem. At one point, he said there's 15 cases. Next week, there'll be zero. Um, look, it's almost too easy to point to the inadequacies, um, the intellectual ineptitude. Um, but the leadership on this issue is, mon is a monumental a failure. And then he's blaming the World Health Organization and he's blaming uh, uh, China. And even though he could have taken action and um, basically used the Defense Production Act to, that is, take over factories, that is, tell businesses and corporations, this is what you are going to produce, whether you like it or not, he really didn't take that action. Now, there are corporations in the United States that did move in that direction. They felt an obligation to do that but he could have been much more aggressive uh, in that way. And of course, he wants to uh, open the economy, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we deal with this crisis? Uh, we don't have a good social welfare system. Workers are insecure. We have a private for-profit public uh, healthcare system. Well, the response did come quickly, and it was remarkable how fast you have to you know, give them credit. I mean, how fast they came up with trillions and trillions of dollars. How often have we proposed social policies and people have said, how are you going to pay for this? That's going to cost a trillion dollars. We can't. Hey, we came up with this money really fast. Okay. And basically, we had to do that because we had all of these gaps in the social welfare system, in the public health system, in the labor market, and we had to fill them with this massive infusion of money. And that's a good thing to the extent that it was used to help workers. It is not a good thing when it's directed toward corporations and corporations uh, have done very, very well. You know, under neoliberalism, it's almost impossible to do any kind of policy unless you include major largesse directed toward private interests and corporations. You've probably heard of the uh, public-private partnerships, right? Like everything has to involve the private sector. The private sector has to be involved and they have to also profit. That was also the case with these relief packages. There was lots and lots of money available directly or when corporations wanted uh, to borrow it. So, <clears throat> That's a pretty serious uh, problem. Now, let me see if I can go back. I just want to go back to, okay. Uh, what is left out? There's a number of things which have been left out of these relief packages. So if you're a progressive and you're looking at uh, what has been included, uh, a great deal has been left out. We know that uh, corporations have taken advantage. Uh, there's a $500 billion account and there's distributions that have been made to that total amount of money. And right now, there's no transparency. So we don't even know where the Trump administration has directed that $500 billion. Um, and that is information people should know, since it may have gone to corporations that actually didn't need it. Uh, but there's a number of things that have been left out of these relief packages. How about guaranteed health care for all Americans? I mean, it's long overdue, but given the severity of this public health crisis, you think that would, been, would have been included. Uh, maybe the guarantee of a living wage long-term paycheck protection, uh, that will end, uh, long-term rent and eviction moratorium, uh, those are ending as well. We know the coronavirus hasn't gone away. I think the economic uh, fallout from this is actually gonna be worse in the next couple months when this relief runs out, when people try to open the economy, when people turn around and say, get back to work, you have no excuse to not be working now, right? Um, how about prohibitions against water and electric shutoffs? Okay, these were things that many people thought should have been included, weren't included. Uh, there should be requirements for personal protective equipment in every single workplace. No worker should be forced to go back to work under conditions that obviously threaten their public health. And um, some support and protection for the homeless, uh, which also should have been included. So, you know, it's good that there was a response that money was distributed to workers who couldn't work whether they wanted to or not. 
but there was a lot left out. And the question is, to what extent will we fill in those gaps when this crisis uh, passes? Okay, so opening the economy. Uh, this is something that obviously Trump was anxious to do uh, because he's worried about the way the economic situation appears and an election is coming up. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, if, if it was wealthy white Americans who were disproportionately impacted uh, by the COVID-19 virus, uh, would there have been uh, so much enthusiasm for opening up the economy? We know that some people are much more vulnerable than others. Uh, and so let's open the economy. And, you know, they, they called them, uh, I, I think Trump referred to them as warriors. Uh, so it's almost as if they're willing to sacrifice themselves uh, for the economy, for the GNP. And they would just be collateral uh, damage. Uh, you know, this kind of language, this way of thinking about uh, workers uh, is, is really, it's just, it's, it's stunning. Um, now, <clears throat> if you think about this, from a maybe more radical perspective, you know, why do people, why are people so anxious to, you know, open the economy, get things going again? Um, if you look at it from the perspective of the capitalist class, uh, the capitalists can't make profit if they don't have workers to exploit. <clears throat> and they don't have workers to exploit if everything is shut down. Now, if you ask leftists, what is the ultimate political action that could be taken? It's called a general strike. What's a general strike? It's when all workers leave the workplace across the entire country, all industries, all businesses. To some extent, we had, for a period of time, something that approximated a general strike. But over time, corporations, the capitalist class, whatever you want to call them, obviously get nervous about this, okay? We can't make money if we don't have workers producing the goods. We got to get them back out there. Also, capitalists can't convert commodities into profit if consumers aren't out shopping and buying the stuff that they uh, don't need, or maybe they do need, it depends. So the money that was pumped into the hands of workers through those relief packages did help stimulate demand, which obviously is vital for profitability. You have to sell the goods, but you also have to produce them. Um, why reopen the economy? Well, you know, capitalists can't shame the unemployed if the workers are prohibited from returning to work. Now, there is a tendency in American society to assume that if you're unemployed, there must be something wrong with you individually. You're not you know, looking for a job. You're not working hard. You don't have enough education, etc. This was a situation where the workers could legitimately say, I can't go to work even if I wanted to. Um, but you don't want that condition to last too long uh, if you're a capitalist. Um, you also can't force workers into the labor force uh, while they're eligible for unemployment benefits, right? So once you open up the economy and you open up these businesses, they can no longer claim the unemployment benefits because their job is available. Now, they may not feel safe going back to the job, but your business is open. You've been called back. You no longer are eligible for unemployment insurance, unemployment benefits, some governments, some state governments have asked businesses to report the workers who are not coming to work so that they can cut them off of the unemployment roll. The federal government has been asking businesses to do the same thing. So the idea is let's force people back into the labor market by cutting off the support they would be getting from the government, which of course is essentially money for not working and people receiving money for not working is a capitalist nightmare. That is the last thing they want. So people are getting pushed back into the labor market, I think prematurely. Hopefully the predictions of some public health officials will not come to pass, but many of them believe that we're in for another uh, real surge. I also think capitalists want us to forget quickly as possible, as quickly as possible how essential and valuable are low wage workers who are in fact the most responsible for the social reproduction of human life. This is one thing we have realized in this crisis, and that is that workers that have been devalued and low paid are ultimately the most critical workers in our economy. And they should use that as leverage. Those workers should use that as leverage now to try to gain some advantage in terms of wages and working uh, conditions. Okay, so 
what are the motives? That's what I was talking about. What are some of the reasons why people are so anxious uh, to push people into the economy again? Workers. One thing I'll say about the unemployment uh, insurance and unemployment benefits in the state of Florida, you probably read stories about people who were obviously eligible for the unemployment, but they had to apply. They had to get online. They had to go to a website to apply for unemployment benefits. And they could not navigate through the maze and the number of forms and the information that was required and had to be reported. This is not an accident, by the way. This is a strategy that the conservative Republicans have been using for a long time. That is, I don't, you know, they don't like the program, but they can't get rid of the program entirely. So let's create all these administrative burdens that make it less likely that people will access the actual benefits they're entitled to. And this was deliberately done under Rick Scott in Florida. <clears throat> then the crisis hit and, you know, DeSantis is presiding over this. And he's concerned because there's a lot of angry people who are entitled to unemployment benefits, but they can't navigate through this deliberately designed maze. And this is not unique to the state of Florida, but it's just one classic example uh, of what has happened under neoliberalism. The idea that, you know, people, even if they're entitled to benefits, let's try to make it as hard and difficult as possible for them to access them. But during this crisis, people realized that people needed to get access to those as quickly as possible. All right. Well, are we going to learn any lessons? They say a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. The question is, who's going to take advantage of it? Uh, a couple things I think we've learned, and that is that um, the economy, including capital and labor, both sides, depend and can't survive without public sector intervention. It's interesting that the people that always argue against government turn to government immediately when there's an economic crisis produced by the very system that they believe shouldn't be interfered with by government, right? Basically, they become socialists overnight. Right. So socialism uh, saves capitalism. It's a great irony and paradox. Um, we obviously can't depend on the market to produce what we need when we need it. That's clear. We talked about that in terms of the corporate restructuring. So we need to take control of certain industries. Some things should be run in the interest of the public. Let me say that again, the public interest. This is a foreign concept to neoliberalism. Public interest. And if that means it's nationalized and it's run by the government, not for profit, but to ensure that we have the supplies and the medical technology we need when we need it, we need to consider that. That would be a lesson learned. Um, another lesson I think is that we no longer can ask the question, how are we going to pay for this? when uh, Bernie Sanders was proposing Medicare for all, uh, so many of the other Democrats said, but Bernie, how are you gonna pay for this? It's gonna cost $2 trillion over 10 years. Hey, we've got $2 trillion in a week, okay? So this deficit myth has to be exploded. And I think to a large extent it will be. And if you're interested in looking at a um, approach to understanding why deficits don't really matter, and this flies in the face of sort of the common understanding. And remember, there's a reason why the elite in the society wants you to believe that, because they don't want you making demands for services, right? It's too expensive. We'll have a deficit. We have to cut spending. We can't expand spending. Check out modern monetary theory. Check out the work of Stephanie Kelton. Uh, she's outstanding. She's excellent. She's been promoting uh, this modern monetary theory and once you understand that theory, you realize there are enormous things we could be doing in this country. We've actually been underspending. We haven't been overspending. Um, I think we have a recognition now of which workers are really essential. Uh, I don't think hedge fund managers fall into the essential category, uh, but I do think that people who work in transportation and logistics and grocery stores and at cash registers. These are the people that have allowed us to shelter in place and survive. And now we know that they are more essential than many people out there who make enormous amounts more than these workers. And clearly we have to 
have universal health care. Uh, the fact that that isn't on the table uh, across the board, uh, even Biden hasn't uh, you know, admitted that we need that yet, uh, is, is outrageous uh, because we know what's happening out there for people who don't have coverage, don't have access, are paying bills. And I know they said everybody gets a test, it's free, and people can get treated. And if it's for COVID-19, you know, it'll be co- it isn't being covered. People are being faced with massive, massive medical bills uh, as a result of this. So we need universal uh, health care, uh, Medicare for all, if you like, uh, the sooner the better. Okay, <clears throat> so what are the political consequences of all this? There's a book written by uh, Naomi Klein. Some of you may be familiar with her work. Uh, she's a great uh, critical analyst of socioeconomic problems from climate change uh, to um, financial crises. And she wrote a book called The Shock Doctrine. And The Shock Doctrine essentially argues that uh, the other word she uses is disaster capitalism. So whenever societies have some kind of natural or unnatural disaster, it could be the 9-11, it could be the great financial crisis, clearly we're going through one now. Um, she points out that there's a history of elites taking advantage of these moments. Uh, people are very vulnerable. Uh, they're disoriented, they're being traumatized, they're fearful. And it's an opportunity for elites to expand the amount of power that they have over the population. And we're seeing this in other countries. We're seeing proposals now in the United States to expand the role of the military. Um, some people are wondering whether we're even going to have an election uh, in November um, because we're in the middle of a public health crisis. We can't have an election. so. Um, Trump will cancel the election. Um, I mean, people are talking about these things. So check out her work because she has written a few pieces recently. And, you know, she's not always a pessimist. Every once in a while she says, you know, crises can be taken advantage of by the forces of darkness, or they can be taken advantage of by the forces of light. And I just covered some of the lessons learned if we take some of those lessons. Uh, Maybe we can see after this crisis, not a rollback in our rights and our ability to freely move and express ourselves politically, but an expansion of democracy. Um, So, you know, somebody might ask, like, you know, are are we going to have a more authoritarian regime as a result of this? Um, You know, libertarians have been out uh, complaining that uh, they can't get a haircut. Uh, so, you know, there's this libertarian movement and then there's the democratic socialists who say, you know, this is the opportunity to totally reconstruct the political economic system and to move beyond, we have to move beyond neoliberalism. We have to move beyond the ideology and we have to move beyond, uh, the policies. I fall in a democratic socialist, uh, position, obviously. Is there going to be a mass uprising? I mean, what if economic conditions get really, really bad over the next five or six months and we get another spike and they cut off relief to workers and people are getting evicted and they can't pay their rent and they're desperate for food, right? When I say sometimes I get very depressed, I have this dark dystopian scenario. They'll be in the streets. They'll They'll be protesting. They'll be rioting. Now, we have an uprising currently, correct? Everyone's aware of this. You've been following it. And did you, do you see how quickly the landscape can change in terms of what is possible and what policies can be entertained once people disrupt the social order? Defund the police? That was a pipe dream a month ago. Now, it's at the center of every proposal about rethinking uh, the way we conceptualize public safety. So, you know, there might be a mass uprising. What would be the result of a mass uprising? Something positive or bringing in the military and having an authoritarian regime? These are big open questions. We don't know how this is going to end. Ideally, we would have a new New Deal. People were hoping that we would have a new New Deal when Obama came into office. We didn't. Obama was essentially a neoliberal president and there was no fundamental restructuring the political economic system. Um, people were shocked that after a crisis of that magnitude, we wouldn't have instituted a different kind of political economic organization to address all of the factors that gave rise 
to the financial crowd, but we didn't. Well, maybe we will after this crisis. And you've heard a lot about the green, the green New Deal. This would be a way to put massive numbers of people to work. And you know, you have to think back to what Roosevelt did under his New Deal, the public programs that he put in place, job creation, building the infrastructure. There's massive amounts of things that people could do. This is a huge opportunity for the Democratic Party, but I'm not sure they're up to the task, frankly. Uh, because remember, the Democratic Party is largely controlled uh, by corporate interests as well as the Republican Party. Maybe not as extreme, but nonetheless, they have their interests, and I'm not hopeful. But it would be a great opportunity, and if this was communicated to people during this crisis, it would make a difference. Uh, public sector priorities and responsibilities. Clearly, the government has some responsibility to protect the population. Hopefully, <clears throat> that will be a consequence. I mentioned gaslighting because I'm worried that this push to open up the economy, get back to normal. I don't think anything is ever going to be back to normal again. But the point is, they're going to try to convince people that, well, all of the horrible things that happened during that crisis because of the inadequacies of the public health system and because of the inadequacy of the social welfare system, don't, don't worry about those. That, that's past. We're fine now. Let's get back to normal. If getting back to normal means essentially re reinstating the very conditions that made it impossible to manage this crisis. That is not gonna be very helpful. I'm hoping workers become more militant. There's been a lot of walkouts, there's been a lot of strikes. Workers have refused to go to work in certain workplaces that are clearly, clearly unsafe. They need to understand that they have a certain amount of power and leverage, and I think many of them have become aware of this now, particularly these essential workers who realize that the flow of goods and commodities on which every single person depends is what they are working in those sectors. Right? Um, we could have a further concentration of wealth and income. Billionaires have been doing very well. I saw some statistic like, you know, $565 billion to the top, you know, 100 billionaires or something. So they're, they're not hurting. And as, <clears throat> and as businesses close, as small business owners lose their property, uh, that property will be bought up and you're going to have a greater concentration, uh, potentially a greater concentration of wealth uh, and property after the crisis uh, than before the crisis. So I'm just posing these as these are possible political economic consequences uh, that might uh, result. Um, I think I'll end it there. That's my email address. If you're interested in communicating, if you want more information, uh, I'm collecting it seems like hundreds and hundreds of articles each week in anticipation of doing more writing on this and also teaching the course with my good colleague, uh, Rick Phillips. Uh, so thank you for your in attention and your indulgence. And now we can talk about the COVID-19 crisis. And let me, okay, there we go. <laughs> thank you, David. A lot of things to digest there. Uh, zillions of questions have popped up in the chat box. Some um, a little off topic, some are on topic. I don't know if you want to browse through those or we could take some questions from the floor. Um, now let's see. <clears throat> There's a lot of them here. I can't answer all these questions. No. No, I just... okay. no, no, let me, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's see. Um, Maybe people should ask, the, if people don't mind asking the question they pose, that might be better than me sort of skimming through. Sure, and David, we had um, Joyti had just raised his hand. Okay. So if you wanna unmute yourself, Joyti. Thank you so much, uh, David. Amazing presentation. Thanks for uh, your expertise and for sharing. And it's coming, your passion is coming right through. And I, namaste. My questions, couple of questions. First of all, is that we need, when are we going to recognize that this SARS-CoV-2, along with HIV, Ebola, MERS, bird flu, swine flu, are coming from the confinement of these animals in close proximity? And yeah, as you mentioned, there are zoonotic diseases. Yeah. So this is, we're not done with this pandemic. And there's another one, H7 and 9, which is brewing, which has 40% mortality rate. So when are we going to realize that our 
uh, our addiction to animal products, this animal slaughter, the con con confined animal feeding operations is causing us pandemics. And secondly, uh, taking a step back and we are experiencing this modern day slavery of these slaughterhouse workers, which are being deemed essential. So they are being exposed to the, this COVID virus. So which is creating another wave. These, these workers have no medical protection. So how do we address the root cause and be the victims which are uh, ingrained in this process? Thank you. Yeah. Um, people have been predicting this for a long time, as you indicated, based on the way in which um, agriculture, food uh, production has been organized, um, deforestation, land grabbing, uh, all of those kinds of things. So, uh, in a, in a sense, as you say, it's not unexpected. And there are people who understand the source of these things and realize that this is not going to be the last and maybe not the worst either. But, you know, it, it takes a global response, I think, to address that. And we don't really have good global governance. Um, I have no hope that the current administration has any interest in addressing these things. Uh, so, you know, you do have to have organization. Uh, people have to be organized politically. Uh, and that's obviously the challenge for any kind of change we want to see. Uh, but globally, you would have to do something because these are global pandemics and you would need a global institution uh, responsible for in some way enforcing the way production is organized and the way that you describe that ultimately makes these um, zoonotic viruses more, more common. We don't have anything like that. Um, the World Health Organization might be the closest thing, uh, and they obviously aren't getting much support from the United States now. And I'm not sure that all countries actually have a lot of faith in that as a global institution. And instead, we're left with the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization has virtually no interest in this because what they want to do is deregulate uh, as much as possible uh, of the uh, entire uh, globe in order to make it safe for uh, private investment. Um, so in terms of the the workers in these meat factories, uh, again, I'm hoping that as a result of this crisis, uh, there has been a higher level of consciousness raised among workers in the extent to which they can, you know, they can shut down the entire system and they need to use that as a form uh, of leverage. That means that workers need the right uh, they need labor market protections. And as I said at the beginning, the United States uh, probably has the weakest labor market institutions uh, of any major uh, industrialized society. Uh, so, you know, you have to put some of those things in place before uh, labor ha has the ability to negotiate uh, the conditions under which it is working. And again, we might think about the role that the government would play uh, if we're dependent on particular forms of production and it's organized in ways that is unhealthy uh, or hazardous, um, then perhaps the government would take control of those. But, you know, after all these crises, you think the, the, pow the power of the corporate elite is, is so strong, it takes enormous amounts of energy to change it. It's not going to happen through the ballot box, I can tell you that. Uh, I don't think either political party is committed to the kinds of progressive change I'm talking about. Uh, it's going to take uh, people on the streets. And, you know, I think the example we've seen over the last two weeks shows the power of that strategy. And sometimes it means that, you know, a couple windows will get broken and, you know, maybe some property will be destroyed. <clears throat> to me, that's a small price to pay. If, there are fundamental substantive changes. But I, I agree with you. It's, it's kind of mind boggling that we know the source of these viruses, but we don't seem to be able to manage any kind of response. Thank you, David. And then um, Susan had her hand raised next. Hi, Susan. Hi, I had several questions. Um, so um, just answer whichever ones you want. I, I don't understand the difference between, or how I don't understand how you're defining capitalism because they seem like part of the evil doers in your story. And it seems like small businesses are also capitalist and 
Um, capitalism can sometimes work faster than government entities. So I was wondering if you address that. And another one of my questions was about um, public schools, because sometimes I think all, you know, the private schools and the charter schools, they take away from the public schools and they also take away from the community wanting to support the public schools. So it's, I would be an advocate of, of, all, of abolishing all um all schools except for the public schools and i wonder what you think of that and if um and what yeah. about the guest worker visas where they're tied to one employer and um they have no path to citizenship what do you what do you think of those and i guess probably i shouldn't ask all my questions give other people time thank you okay well some of those are sort of beyond the scope of what we're discussing here but that, that's okay um maybe in the context of the political economic system they're all relevant. Uh, on the first one, <clears throat> one thing I always tell my students, I'm glad you actually asked this question. I said, there's no capitalism. There are capitalisms. Uh, there are different forms of capitalism. And um, in the classes I teach, uh, I talk about the distinction between, and you know, people have tried to slice and dice different, like Anglo uh, capitalism, um, Nordic capitalism, uh, communitarian Asian forms of capitalism. So there's not a monolithic uh, form of capitalism. The form of capitalism I'm describing is one particular form. It's neoliberal capitalism. And it is probably, as I said, in its most advanced um, application uh, in the United States. So I'm not really, uh, as a socialist, I mean, ultimately, I do think that many of the problems we have can be attributed to capitalism. And I would prefer to see the entire a society organized differently, uh, but I'm a realist. And so um, I think that we could, obviously we're gonna retain capitalism. And many of the countries that are able to manage this crisis much better than us, European countries, and some of the, uh, what we call the Nordic capitalist countries, those are capitalist countries. The means of production are privately owned. Uh, there's private profit, uh, but they have a much expanded um, social welfare state. Uh, unions have a uh, strong power. Most workers are represented. They have labor market institutions. So in that sense, I would say that we could uh, create a, a form of capitalism that would have a human face. Right now we have the most extreme form of neoliberal predatory capitalism. And it's no surprise that because of that, <clears throat> we are managing this crisis probably worse than any other comparable country, comparable in terms of level of economic development and resources. Um, let's see, you asked about the schools. There was something before that, what was it? Yes, workers oh, and schools. Okay, yeah, uh, what we need to do is tax the rich, uh, not uh, have a sales tax uh, for the schools, okay? It's as simple as that. Um, I'm not for charter schools. I'm for public schools. I agree with you. So this idea that we have a shortage of money uh, is because we're not actually deriving the revenue from the people who have the most wealth and income. And, you know, that's a, that's a function of um, the neoliberal model. You know, I mean, the, the people who, you know, are the, the political elite in Jacksonville will tell you that, you know, in order for the economy to be successful, we have to keep taxes as low as possible. Um, so this is the mantra you hear. It's part of neoliberalism. Uh, so, I, so, so I agree with you uh, that we should be funding the public schools. They should be getting as much money as any other school. It shouldn't be diverted to private charter schools. Um, I think you're not surprised to hear that's my position. Um, and, you know, in terms of the guest, this guest worker program, you know, this is the way, you know, not all capitalists are opposed to immigration, right? I mean, many of them want you know, these workers to come to the United States and ideally, uh, you know, under conditions that make it impossible for them uh, to organize, uh, to move to a different uh, business, to have any kind of leverage in terms of bargaining power. Uh, and so uh, the guest worker program is just one way to simply control uh, a segment of the labor force uh, that can be exploited with um, low wages and crappy working conditions. So I, I agree with you. Susan, something should be done about that. Any Fred? other questions? Anyone want to jump in? Fred, can... It looks like Fred actually has a hand up. Yeah. Um, that's, um, 
Why don't you get a comment on the uh, influence of the rising nationalist movement around the world, which is, you know, we have increasingly totalitarian governments, which are really horrible for the people, but they do an increasing in Europe and, you know, here in, in the United States with Trumpism and in Brazil and other nations, and also how this impacting global climate change. And it seems like the, uh, you know, the pandemic is a part of that. And it's just like our capacity to respond is uh, being, um, you know, these global events are being curtailed by extreme nationalism. And it's like, we're going to do it on our own. And the hell with the environment, just, you know, more environmental destruction. It just seems all plays into this, uh, you know, increasingly, we're going to have more pandemics. And it seems we're just you know, putting ourselves going to turn to the destruction of civilization the way it seems we're, we're going. If we don't learn some way to deal with this in a rational manner, which is where we have so much irrationalism with nationalism. Right. Well, one of the reasons there's nationalism is because people look at what globalization has done to their domestic economies and what it's done to the working class uh, in the United States. Um, so it becomes attractive and it can be used um, by the right uh, and it's used very effectively. And Trump actually used it very effectively when he ran against Clinton. Uh, remember, Clinton essentially was you know, promoting uh, additional trade agreements, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, those kinds of things. Um, but you've got the working class that have been devastated uh, by NAFTA, which was promoted by Clinton. And so, you know, nationalism emerges during these periods when there's kind of a gap in what I would call the uh, democratic socialist or the social democratic left. Where is the social democratic left in the United States? Uh, you know, the Democratic Party gave up on the working class a long time ago. It's a, it's a party largely for the professional managerial class. <clears throat> so you leave an opening for Trump to argue that, you know, many of the problems you have uh, are a result of these global trade agreements and that we need to focus on economic nationalism. It was a powerful message and he used it wisely and the Democrats left themselves wide open to it. Um, so I think that's, you know, that, that's where you see the emergence of this authoritarianism. Uh, some people link it to populism. Um, there's sort of a critique now of populism. Generally, I don't think populism is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, historically, the United States, populism was a movement against elites and against the contra concentration of elite uh, power. Uh, and I think the reason you see rise of populism, and sometimes that does tend to move in a right-wing direction, as you say, and move into authoritarianism, <clears throat> is the failure of liberal democratic institutions. Uh, you, you know, you have Democrat, uh, people in the Democratic Party you know, concerned that, you know, a large percentage of the American population doesn't have the respect for the liberal democratic institutions they should have. Well, there's a reason, because the liberal democratic institutions, which we have, we do have liberal democratic institutions, but what has happened over the last 30 or 40 years? You've had the concentration of wealth, concentration of income, concentration of political power. So when that happens, people start looking elsewhere. Um, so it's not surprising that, you know, you can think of Bernie Sanders as kind of a form of populism, right? You had the populism on the left, Bernie Sanders, populism on the right, uh, Trump. Uh, I think I know which one you would prefer, Fred. Um, so we have to, you know, we have to make it clear that there are policies that can be labeled as nationalistic, as in the national interest, as in the interest of the American working class, without necessarily you know, having that bleed into authoritarianism, right? So I think there, there's, I'm not going to say that all forms of nationalism uh, are necessarily bad. Um, and, you know, global neoliberalism is totally opposed to the forms of nationalism because they don't want foreign governments to be determining the conditions that corporations have to meet when they invest in those countries, right? So democratically elected Governments that may be are popular, that want to put in place, let's say, some environmental regulations on corporations. Under the World Trade Organization, these corporations can sue the government uh, for, you know, um, restricting the level of profit they would have been getting otherwise. Uh, so that's the global system that we have. 
the World Trade Organization is the body. Um, there are forms of economic nationalism that actually would serve the interests of the, of the, the people. Um, so, you know, I've, I've said a lot, I've, I've talked around, I don't know if I addressed everything you, you asked me, Fred. <laughs> sure, and uh, uh, one aspect I think that's yeah. happening is that when, you know, good policies are put in place, but then Republicans take over and they put in underfunded or put in people who are incompetent or corrupt. So then it fails as they see, that's what happens. Right, right. <clears throat> yeah. So, so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when they say government doesn't work well uh, when they're in power. Uh, they certainly confirm that proposition. Um, and the, the other thing is with this, um, you know, I talked about the deficit myth. One of the problems I have with the, the way Democrats sometimes, like we had this uh, major tax reform bill, right, that uh, Trump pushed through, uh, obviously was designed uh, to essentially concentrate more income and wealth in the hands of the few. Uh, but, you know, it was called tax reform and lots of people, you know, they don't like taxes. So, uh, you know, they don't understand the difference between progressive and regressive taxes. But any, in any case, it was clear that this was going to create less revenue for the government. And, you know, what did the Democrats do? They say, well, you know, it's going to create huge deficits. We shouldn't have these huge deficits, right? Well, that was passed in 2017. Right now, we have one of, even before COVID-19, we have one of the hugest deficits in history. So then what the Republicans will do, they'll turn back to the Democrats and say, you know, you were right. You were right. These deficits are horrible. We're going to take care of these deficits. We're going to cut Social Security. We're going to cut Medicare. We're going to cut Medicaid. So the Democrats shouldn't be complaining about deficits. It's politically bad. What they should have said is, we oppose the tax reform. We want to raise taxes. What? You want to raise? Yes, on the rich. And by the way, there's a vast majority of Americans, every survey, uh, 60, 70 percent, and this includes Republicans, tax the rich, a more progressive tax system. That's what they need to propose. And then we would have more revenue to do what we need to do. But again, deficits are not, we can print as much money as we want to spend. It's a sovereign currency. We're not Greece. We're not using the euro. We control our own currency. And that's the argument that um, Stephanie Kelton and the modern monetary theorists uh, make. Uh, there's really no limit. Now, at some point, obviously, there could be an inflationary problem, but that's, there's, that's remote particularly at this time. Um, all right, somebody had a hand up. Or a, hey, a, David, just if, if I can jump in on that uh, point. I yeah. saw Stephanie, before her book came out, she was on Chris Hayes's uh, podcast a while ago. And um, it, you know, it sounds fantastical. Oh, deficits don't matter. Well, I understood from, from her uh, work, they matter, but the measurement that you use to know when it matters is different than some absolute number like 10 trillion. That's right. Right. It's connected to the capacity and, and the activity in the in the economy and the potential. So 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 they matter, but it's on a much different scale than we're used to, to thinking. Right. Is right. that a fair comment? Yeah, no, that's a fair comment. And if you think about what they would be spending the money on, okay, that's not irrelevant. So when we talk about taxing and spending, and that's sort of a phrase that's sometimes used as a negative. <clears throat> characterization of a you know tax and spend liberal, um, you know all governments tax and all governments spend. The question is who's paying the taxes and what are they spending the money on? Uh, in Europe, people don't complain that much about the tax because they get a shitload of benefits for those ta for for the tax rates that they pay. Um, so the, the the deficit issue that she's talking about is, in other words, the, the measures that she would use to determine whether the deficit became a se severe problem, as you say, are different measures, and the current state of the economy is nowhere close to any of those. We could be spending a lot more money. And as you mentioned, if you're spending money on productive investment, infrastructure, you're, you're hiring people, you're paying wages, paying income, this actually makes the economy more productive. And so I think when she thinks about the spending, it's not just spending on anything like weapons. It's spending on particular forms of a public uh, infrastructure investment. I'm losing my voice. Okay. Oh. Any more questions out there for David? 
Jeanette, did you have your hand up? I thought I was, maybe not. Yes, I do. I would like sure. to ask a question, please. Um, you know, we, what do you, if we don't get money out of our federal elections, it, 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 we're not going to get anything ever accomplished. They're not voting along with people overwhelmingly support the issues the general masses support. They are they are doing the bidding of the big investors in their campaigns and the, the capitalists who are in, donating to these huge packs and and until we get that money, until we get money out of elections, until the elections are federally funded, until we find a way to run fair and honest campaigns, it's, it's not going to change. They're not interested in doing what people are electing them to do. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is whether or not, you know, if we could get young people to go to the doggone polls and vote we can't and until we pass laws that require everyone 18 and older as long as you're drawing a coherent breath you must vote or pay a fine and it can be a $20 fine it can be whatever but you have got to we have got to find some way to encourage people to vote and until that happens, we're not going to change anything. Okay. Uh, I agreed with your first comments, definitely, about the role of money. <clears throat> we have, uh, there's something called the investment theory of politics. And essentially, it defines the people who are most active and the parties. Uh, they, they view pretty much what they do in terms of uh, attracting investment. The parties try to attract investment. And the people who make the investments obviously have economic interests that do not align with the majority of working people. Uh, that's the two-party system we have. Um, so I think you've identified the problem with the party system and uh, the role of money. Uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, but I think we also need to get rid of the two-party system. We need a multi-party system in the United States. If you look at the level of uh, participation in other countries that have a multi-party system, the levels of participation are much higher. Now, I don't like to shame people who don't vote. Uh, it's not my thing. Um, I understand your point uh, about, you know, if they express certain political sentiments, but they don't translate those into any political action, I think that is a problem, right? So I want them to be publicly engaged and publicly involved. On the other hand, there's reasons why lots of people don't vote. Uh, sometimes they don't vote because they don't really think there's a significant difference, ultimately, in what's going to happen regardless of which party wins the election. It's up to parties to mobilize people. That's the other thing. And so, you know, for, I mean, now it's, you know, we're having this debate now where, you know, I was over on the Bernie side and when Bernie stepped down, I thought prematurely, and then he, you know, endorsed Biden, which is inexplicable to me. I didn't understand that either, but that's okay. You know, he's being a good democratic party soldier. You know, they expected all of the uh, young people who were supporting Bernie to jump on the bandwagon. Um, why would they jump on Biden's bandwagon? I mean, he represents everything in the Democratic Party that led them to Bernie Sanders in the first place, right? So, you know, you have to mobilize people. So if you want those young people to vote, well, Biden needs to actually put forward some policies that address the issues that they're most concerned with or policies that perhaps Bernie was promoting <clears throat> that did mobilize them but many of them are not gonna be mobilized. Um, I think most of them ultimately come November will vote against Trump. That's the way they're gonna put it. They're not gonna say they're, not gonna say they're voting for Biden. They're gonna say they're voting against Trump, which in a two party system is the same thing, right? You know, but if we had, multi, if we had a multi-party system, and by the way, the one thing the two parties agree on, I know that they don't agree on much. The one thing they agree on is they do not ever wanna see a third party they do not want to see a Green Party. They do not want those parties to be involved in any of the debates. So in a sense, you know, you, the first comments you made, you talked about the fact that the parties are totally dominated by corporate interests and money. And so therefore, there's no difference between them. But then you're expecting people necessarily to vote. So what we got to do, like you say, let's get the money out. 
ideally that would make it more possible to propose policies that are not in the interest exclusively of the corporate elite, right? Um, but I think we need multi, multi, a multi-party system <clears throat> where people can actually identify a party that represents their political ideology, their political program. Right now, majority of Americans probably are disgusted with the choice that they're facing uh, in November. Um, and it'll be a vote against uh, something not a vote for. So uh, we got big problems. Somebody just wrote a book about the problem with the two-party system. Lee uh, Drut Drutman, I think is his name. Uh, I need to get that book because um, I'm strongly in favor. Well, I just on a per this is just sure. my yeah. opinion. I, but I do think, you know, if, if some of these third party players that came in didn't come across as so batshit crazy, they would probably do better. If you could get somebody. What do you have in mind, just as an example? So we know Well, I think, I think just, I think this, I think his name is Justin. He's was, I don't like the Libertarian Party, okay? But I think he comes across as sane. I, he was a Republican and he left the Republicans because of Trump. And um, Justin yeah. Amash, what is I know. Yeah, I know who you're talking about, yeah. So anyway, but there are people that occasionally do come across. I, you know, to me, um, when... Oh my, I'm, I'm having a momentary brain lapse. I, I apologize. Mean, you can't but really the, have a third the party. The guy who originally, who originally caused problems for um, Ralph Nader, I think he comes <laughs> across as a little batshit crazy to people. Um, so, you know, well, yeah. Ross Perot. Now, Ross Perot didn't do all that bad, if you really <clears> think about it. Did, didn't he get like 25%? Yeah, no, he, he, yeah he, he got a large percentage of the vote. But here's the thing. <clears throat> the third party isn't going to work in a two-party system. They're just going to draw votes away, and people will be accused, which they were in large numbers, who supported Nader, you're responsible for uh, W, right? So you, these parties are not viable as long as we have what's called a single member district, winner take all, first across the post, whatever you want to call the, uh, we have an electoral system in this country that guarantees essentially two parties, inevitably. Um, and anytime you, you have a third party, they're the spoiler, uh, or you're throwing your vote away, or you gave the election to this candidate because you voted your conscience, right? You vote your conscience and you're shamed for it. That's the problem we're facing. I mean, that's one of the many problems. By the way, there's something called the Electoral Integrity Index. If anyone's interested in this, because when you ask Americans, do you live in a democracy? Oh, of course, yeah, we live in, we have the greatest democracy in the world. You know, this is the slogan you hear, the greatest democracy in the world. Well, what, what do you mean by that, the greatest democracy in the world? And then they'll say, well, you know, we have elections, we can vote for. Well. There is this institute, they do an electoral integrity index, where they gather information on the electoral system of all the major Western, the major democracies in the world, many of them are Western European countries as well. We're dead last. We're dead last on the electoral integrity index. So, you know, if somebody says, well, we don't want to mess with the system <laughs> because we don't want to ruin a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing. It's, it's the worst electoral system. And, it, and that's for a variety of reasons, having to do with two parties rather than multi-party, having to do with gerrymandering, uh, having to do with registration to vote, uh, voting, you know, having voting on Tuesdays. Uh, there's a whole series of indicators that go into the score that a country gets on this index. So, you know, this is, I'd like to hear more people talk about uh, the problems with our electoral system and the two-party system. I think that would be a breath of fresh air. And, and for the most part, nobody, nobody really talks about it. And of course, the two parties really are benefiting from this arrangement. So they have no interest in promoting an alternative. Hey, David, we had a question in chat uh, concerning uh, the general strike idea. He says, so if you're saying if we're striking anyway, we might as well get something out of it. What would be the most crucial policy or concession? Well, I think it probably depends on the workers and what industry they're in. 
Uh, we were talking about these essential workers. Um, first of all, living wage would be a nice start. Um, maybe some benefits, um, maybe a little more control over the conditions of work. As a socialist, you know, I believe in workers control. I know that seems like a pipe dream, uh, but I think they are in a, a, <clears throat> in a stronger bargaining position. Now, the problem is, you know, the general strike is when the workers decide they're all walking out. In this case, they didn't decide, you know, the economy was shut down, but they began to realize how critical they were because of the, the fact that so many people, particularly the corporate elite, um, you saw some of these protests to open up the economy, like in Michigan, right, where they like stormed the state house. Um, you know, these are being mobilized and funded by conservative organizations. Uh, conservative organizations that don't like the idea that workers are getting money for not working. Um, so I think just raising the level of consciousness, it's impossible really to pull off a, a general strike probably in the United States because workers are totally disorganized. You know, I mean, 11% of the workforce is represented by a union. You go to some European countries, it's like 70, 80%. They actually have parties that, you know, sometimes you could call it a labor party that represents their, we don't have a labor party. You know, the Democrats like to think they're a Labor Party, uh, but they're, they're not. At one time, they might have had a better connection to organized labor, but they've done nothing for organized labor over the last 20 or 30 years. <clears throat> so, um, you know, those are the kinds of things they should be um, organizing for and, you know, withdrawing their labor power. I think they realize the power that they have. Um, there are choke points in the uh, economy and the global, you know, um, dispersion of production uh, produces these uh, choke points. Uh, some of you know that I used to spend a lot of time studying uh, logistics and shipping and containers and <laughs> the deepening of the St. John's River and all that. But the point was that a port is a choke point. Um, that's where the goods are coming in. And the capitalists want those goods to get into the economy so they can be sold. And so those workers, longshore workers, um, truck drivers, move containers, people who work in warehouses, uh, they have uh, an enormous amount of, I call latent, latent power. It hasn't been manifested yet, but I think as a result of this crisis, the level of awareness and consciousness of the power they have has been enhanced. And then um, looks like a Tom Larson has his hand raised, if you wanna go ahead, Tom. Hi, Tom. Good to see you. Good to see you, and thank you. I'm interested to identify what pathways of change seem to be likely to bring us the most effective outcomes. You know, is, is it getting out the vote? Is it getting more people registered to vote? Is it educating people about how their interests are being trashed by these policies? You know, I, I, I just wonder about our regional electorate here seems to be either cowed into submission or just kept so ignorant they don't know what's happening to them or they think they'll win the lottery and when they do win, they don't wanna pay taxes. What, what do you think about the pathways to change? Well, I don't think, like I said, that the electoral road is necessarily the best way. On the other hand, you can raise levels of consciousness. I mean, Bernie ran an electoral campaign and, you know, massive numbers of people uh, became politicized as a result of that. <clears throat> now, the problem is what happens when the campaign ends or what happens when the election is over? This is the problem in American uh, politics. We have what uh, Sheldon Wolin called a managed democracy. Uh, that is, you know, they that is the elite, those, the political parties, they determine, you know, when we can participate, right? Like, okay, we're going to have an election. Now it's time to participate. But, you know, if, if things don't work out, they always say, well, wait till the next election, right? Or, you know, if you didn't vote, you can't complain <laughs> or something like that. So a lot of activity has to take place uh, outside, extra electoral activity. I mean, you can mobilize people, but, you know, what happens to all those people, for example, that were mobilized on a progressive agenda uh, by uh, Bernie's uh, campaign. I'm just using that as one example, Tom. So those 
you know, the people who supported Bernie, they're really not partisans, right? It's not like, okay, well, Bernie didn't win. So now I'm, you know, I'm a Democrat. I'm going to vote for Biden. These are, these people are connected to issues, progressive right. issues. That's what mobilized them. And I think we have to think more about how we canvass and contact people on issues that affect their daily life, not on partisanship, right? Partisanship is not going to get these people to vote for Biden, right? They're not into this, you know, I'm on the blue team. They're on the red team. That crap just doesn't work with this generation. And I'll give them credit for not being manipulated by, by that. But I think what they do care about are issues. So I'll just tell you, you know, in terms of the Democratic Socialists of America, which I'm a member and co-chair currently of the local chapter, you know, even before Bernie withdrew, they were encouraging every chapter to keep in touch with every one of those Bernie supporters and start talking about the issues that they care about and to try to make some kind of progress on those issues. If you can find candidates to support them, that's fine. They're not opposed to electoral strategies. Um, but the idea is to mobilize people around certain policies that might be able to be instituted uh, at the local level, at the state level. This is where things are starting. Uh, there are council members that are uh, elected in different cities that represent a much, much more progressive outlook. Uh, not in Jacksonville, not yet, okay? We're a very conservative city, as, as you said, but that doesn't mean there aren't some districts where you could find some city council people to run. So what's, an, what, what's the issue or the campaign that I think could mobilize a lot of people just in terms of what we should be doing as, as part of the democratic socialists? This is just, just an example. <clears throat> to me, it's, it's uh, tenants' rights and housing justice, right? I mean, most people struggle to pay their mortgage. They struggle to pay their rent. They have relationships with landlords. They don't have access to affordable housing. Increasing numbers of people are devoting a huge amount of their income to shelter. These are things that you can actually mobilize people around because they deal with these problems on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So, you know, the question you ask is, you know, how can we, I mean, I, I've struggled with this all my life. I've been heavily involved in politics. It's like, we can educate people, we can mobilize people, we can get out and protest. You know, all of these things are, you know, the sad thing is we haven't, at least on my side of the political spectrum, we haven't been terribly uh, successful. But this is a crisis moment, and I think we can raise a lot of consciousness around this crisis, but we have to take the upper hand. And I'm worried that the conservatives are going to get the upper hand. They have more power, they have more influence, they have more money. The Black Lives Matter outburst, the, the emergence of the repeated demonstrations, even here in Jacksonville, is pretty impressive. Yep. How does it get turned into something that's effective, ultimately? I think it has. And as I mentioned before, that, um, you know, nobody was talking. I had somebody come to campus about a year and a half ago. You may be familiar with him now because he's getting a lot of media attention with the uh, police violence issue. His name is Alex Vitali. I would strongly recommend you check out his book, The End of Policing, or just do a Google search because he's writing all kinds of op-ed pieces. Um, <clears throat> and basically, I don't think he used the slogan, but it was basically defund uh, the police. And that was like a non-starter, right? I mean, there's lots of people on the left and radicals, but generally that was not, nobody would sign on to that. Two weeks of these protests, people on the streets, that's become a central demand and almost every city is going to have to do something to address it it doesn't mean abolish the police overnight i think it means three things one is <clears throat> you look at what percent of the budget is going to the police and in major cities we're talking 30 40 percent here in jacksonville right so there's a budgetary issue the second is if we cut their budget where do we divert and transfer that money into other kinds of investments that actually support programs that would get at the source of violence to begin with, right? People have been arguing for that. And then a third is just to rethink public safety. And people have done that. It's like public safety is not dependent on having police officers armed with weapons who think of themselves as warriors, right? 
So we have to rethink the whole idea of what public safety means. And it doesn't have to involve police at all. So when he was talking about the end of policing, he was basically saying the police are involved in every aspect of our lives and they're totally ill-equipped to handle it. And, you know, in many cases, they just make matters worse, as we saw in Atlanta. Today, most people will say, you know, if there's a problem, the last thing I'm going to do is call the police. <laughs> it's the last thing I'm going to do because I value human life. So, you know, the consciousness has been raised pretty radically. And as you said, you know, here in Jacksonville, it's a, and look what happened to the monuments, right? Curry wasn't in favor of taking down the monuments, but he knew that there was going to be a large crowd. I'll call it a mob. They do fear the people in Hemming Park on that Saturday. And he wanted to take the wind out of their sails. And um, look, look at the result. And, you know, they've been working on that take them down for years. Yeah. Overnight. And obviously they were galvanized by the, um, the larger protest against police violence. You know, they knew that to get them, take them down rally was going to be larger than any rally they ever had because people were already mobilized. Right. Um, so, you know, social change comes in a variety of ways, but you cannot, you have to create some level of social discomfort and social disorder. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? I don't see anything new in the chat or anybody else's hand raised. I'll ask a question, but I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> oh, you got it, Carrie. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. I hope this question isn't too depressing, but... I don't mind being depressed. That's I, I there, enjoy that. there are issues raised on the news that lead me to believe there's ramifications to all this <laughs> unemployment and people losing their houses and the, the food chain backing up. They've thrown away potatoes because they can't get them to market and oil, they're dumping oil. What do you see as the long-term effect on our economy of all this unemployment? Well, there's the depressing scenario <clears throat> where people will just be left to their own devices. Now, I don't think people were go are going to accept that. So in that list of possible political economic consequences, one was a mass uprising. Um, now, you would hope that the mass uprising would produce the progressive kinds of things we just talked about in terms of the police violence issue. Mm. <clears throat> but you also have the possibility that the mass uprising will be met with, and by the way, Trump proposed uh, the protests that are happening now related to police violence. He wanted to send in the military. Uh, he doesn't think people even have a constitutional right to protest. Um, so, you know, it can go both ways. But I do think the economic deprivation is going to be great. And I think we're going to have to figure out ways to organize work differently. And that doesn't just mean that we're all going to be at home you know, doing Zoom conferences, but I think that's going to be uh, a part of it. But, you know, the economy has never been able to produce, the capitalist economy, you know, left to its own devices in the United States has never been capable of producing a sufficient number of jobs that provide people with a quality of life might, you know, be hoping for too much, but at least a, a decent income. Uh, so, you know, I talked about the precariat, the precarious work, mm issue. So, you know, we have to rethink all these things. And, you know, during a crisis, this is the time to do it. Um, but my concern is that, you know, they're going to try to push everybody back out into the economy as quickly as possible. They're going to cut off their benefits and they're going to try to gaslight people and convince them that, you know, what you remember about that crisis, it really wasn't that bad. It wasn't that serious. We were able to manage it. We did okay. And, um, you know, we'll go back to what they consider to be normal, that is, they'll be in charge. And, uh, you know, I mean, the capitalist class and a ruling class continues to do very well um, <laughs> under all, all these conditions. So, you know, it, it's hard to, to know which way it's going to go. But, you know, sometimes when you least expect, expected, um, was I, was I muted? Okay. You want to mute me? 
I did that. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I tried to mute Carrie's and then, okay. I, then I switched back to you. Yeah, Sorry. That's okay. well, I did it as fast as this I could. This would not be the first time that somebody <laughs> has wanted to mute me. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Um, it was a Star Trek theme. <laughs> I don't, you know, I mean, we're we're trying to speculate on what the political outcome is going to be and how bad conditions are going to get that might stimulate a certain kind of political outcome. Um, and I'm with you. You know, when this crisis first began, uh, I have to say, I just I saw nothing but darkness ahead, and I still don't think we know um, how bad the economic situation is going to get. Uh, because so far we've been able to at least forestall some of the difficulties people are facing with these relief packages and with moratoriums on eviction and rent. All of that stuff is is uh, set to expire. And it's not clear uh, that there is the will or the desire, especially of those who want everything to go back to normal, um, to allow any ever... more major spending bills that would support people. So. You know, and then, you know, when you, you say, what will, what will unemployment look like? What will employment look like? Different. Um, I think a lot of people will find that the job they had, even when we get back to the normal economy, does not exist anymore. And so unemployment rates will be very high. Um, if you want Trump out of office, you know, maybe you, you hope that, uh, you know, economic conditions will not be ideal in November, uh, assuming we have an election in November. Hasn't been canceled yet, but remember, I mean, the mail-in voting issue is still up in the air. Um, by the way, if we had mail-in voting, we wouldn't have a participation problem. I think uh, you, you would see really high rates of participation. Um, I mean, there's some people that are just going to reject the system. Uh, that's a political statement. Some people don't vote because it's just a political statement. They just don't want to dignify the two-party system with their vote. <clears throat> but you know, making it easier to vote, I mean, the Republicans have known this for a long time, right, uh, is not in their interest. Mm. So I don't know. It's a, you know, I feel like I'm going around and around here, but it's, you know, it's just something I'm, I think about too. You know, where is this going to take us in a year from now? You know, it's, it's unclear. Fascism is, you know, not a remote possibility. It's possible. Some people think we have something approximating a fascist system today. So, Not but it could yet. be nasty. It could be even nastier. Somebody wrote a book called "Friendly Fascism." You know, you know, nice fascism, but it could get ugly. Um, you know, if people are really economically desperate and they're on the streets and they're, you know, what do they have to lose? Their life, probably. They send in the military. Okay, I'm going down that dark alley, so I'm going to stop there. Well, that was a wonderful talk. Wonderful. Well, thanks for inviting me. Again, First Coast Free Thought Society is the forum for intelligent conversation. And I appreciate everyone's attention and indulgence. Um, you know, like I said, I haven't done this presentation. It's also very strange talking to a computer, I have to say. Uh, I have given talks for the First Coast Free Thought Society um, in person where there's people, I can see them, they smile, they nod. Uh, I'm very animated, I walk around. So this is very restrictive, uh, but I hope it uh, worked uh, to your satisfaction. Oh, David, thank you. Did thank a you. Great job. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a lot to chew on. We appreciate yes, it. very good. Thank All right, you. we'll have this uh, talk posted on our website. Uh, in the next few days, so you can get a replay there and send links to your friends. Uh, and we thank you for coming. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>